All right, guys, welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about arterial catheters. So arterial catheter is essentially a pulse monitoring device. And an arterial catheter setup uh, looks something like this. You'll have an intraarterial catheter, which is a soft, flexible catheter, which is introduced into a major artery in the body. And this device can measure uh, fluctuations in vascular pressure, which we'd call the pulse. And this pulse, this um, pulsatile movement of fluid cause fluctuations in a column of saline that we are attaching our catheter to. So this column of saline that's um, filling the tubing uh, displaces a manometer or a pressure measure. And so we can take that information, we can transform it into an electrical signal and measure that information and, and help us take care of our patient. So that's what that looks like. Uh, if you have a cartoon of it, you have that arterial line into the arterial, uh, into the artery. Uh, it's connected to a saline-filled non-compressible tubing, uh, which is supplied by a pressure bag. And then this has a manometer uh, midway through, which is uh, attached to a transducer, which can, which can turn that pulsatile signal into an electrical signal on our monitor. So what that looks like in practice, and when you overlay it with an EKG tracing, is you have the green line, which is the EKG tracing, which shows the electrographic activity of the cardiac cycle and the uh, contraction of the heart and then followed by this QRS complex, which we know is ventricular depolarization. You see that shortly afterwards, followed by a pulsatile arterial waveform, which uh, is composed of a couple different parts. And this can be broken down in this nice diagram right here. Uh, you see that the bottom and the top uh, of this arterial waveform show us the diastolic and systolic blood pressure. And then this waveform can also be broken into the periods of systole and diastole where blood is being ejected from the ventricles and blood is filling the ventricles respectively. Um, of note, there's uh, a little notch here during uh, in the period between systole and diastole, which is known as the dichrotic notch. And this is a period where the aortic valve is closing. And so in proximal arteries, this is caused because you have a temporary and short-lived backflow of blood before the aortic valve fully closes. And then in more distant arteries, this is actually because of the relaxation of the arteries and the artery walls causing a slight dip in pressure. Uh, and so this can be helpful information when we're trying to diagnose and look at certain types of cardiovascular disease. So now moving on to uh, the calibration and the accuracy of the arterial line. So this is all centered around a concept known as damping. And so damping is basically the concept that the energy of the pulse is absorbed downstream uh, because that energy, that pulse is essentially a wave. And so as that wave is transmitted down the artery, down the arterial system, down to the arterioles, which are those high resistance vessels before you get into a place of gas exchange, uh, some of that energy is dissipated along the way. And that really has to do mostly with the length of the blood vessels traveled and the resistance of the arterioles. And so you can think of this concept of damping as a shock absorber uh, that absorbs some of that energy, or it can also be thought of as a bouncing ball. And so I like to think of this bouncing ball diagram, looking at how the energy kind of is bouncing less and less as you move uh, down the path of the bouncing ball. And so um, that's one way to conceptualize damping. And so damping, uh, can tell us a little bit about the calibration of our arterial line. And like I said, um, there's kind of, there's certain degrees of shock absorption that happen when you have that pulse, that wave uh, going from the heart down the arterial system. And so when you have a uh, arterial line that is under damped, that's essentially uh, less loss of pulse energy along the arterial system. And so this is also colloquially known as a whip. Um, and that's because it's literally sometimes due to the, the tip of the catheter whipping around in a relatively large artery for the size of the catheter. And so that can be one mechanism for under damping. It can also be because of tachydysrhythmia. So a lot of high intensity uh, frequent heartbeats can uh, lead to more of a under damping picture in arterial alliance. And so what this looks like, because you can have uh, falsely high systolic blood pressures, falsely low diastolic blood pressures, and subsequently, as you might imagine, a wider pulse pressure. Interestingly, the mean arterial pressure is not impacted on an underdamped, or for that matter, an overdamped A-line. And so that waveform that we talked about earlier will show a faster rise and a faster fall. It'll be a little more sharper in nature as well. It'll be less rounded. And then it'll have uh, multiple oscillations on the downslope, which we'll talk about in a second. So that's what that looks like. If you have uh, an arterial line that's kind of uh, centered and cleared, and then you 
try to evaluate its damping properties. So you look and you see this kind of sharp upstroke, a uh, relatively narrower waveform. And then on the downstroke, you see this kind of sawtooth pattern, which shows um, that there's uh, not as much shock absorption or not as much damping happening as this wave dissipates down the arterial system. And so that's kind of what we see, what we expect to see when we're looking at an underdamped A line. Now, on the other side of the coin, you have this phenomenon known as overdamping. And so overdamping is essentially more loss of energy as that wave dissipates down uh, the arterial system. And so um, because we think of damping as a shock absorber, intuitively you can kind of probably imagine a couple things that could cause overdamping when you're trying to troubleshoot your arterial line. And those include uh, things like large air bubbles, either in the catheter or in the artery itself. Uh, if the catheter is kinked or has a clot in it, that can certainly absorb some of that energy. Uh, if you have any loose connections in your arterial line, certainly if your hummy or any of the connections are loose and not well attached and losing some pressure, that can certainly cause overdamping. Uh, Interestingly, if you have more compliant tubing than normal, uh, which is a little unusual as there's usually kind of a standard tubing that we use, or if the tip of the catheter, the arterial catheter is up against a vessel wall, that can certainly dissipate some of that energy uh, prematurely and cause overdamping. And so kind of contrary to what we see in underdamping, the manifestations are basically the opposite. You see a phenomenon with a falsely low systolic blood pressure, you have a falsely high diastolic blood pressure, and accordingly a narrowed pulse pressure. And again, as we said, the mean arterial pressure is not really impacted. And so what does that look like when you're looking at the waveform? Well, it's, uh, it's as I said, kind of those uh, softer peaks that are more rounded, uh, slightly lower amplitude with that lower systolic and higher diastolic blood pressure, and then more sluggish oscillations, if there are any oscillations on the downslope at all. So that's what that overdamped waveform looks like. And that's because of that phenomenon of the arterial system or anything around it kind of absorbing more of that arterial pulse energy out of the pulse. And so how do we determine if our uh, arterial catheter is appropriately damped? Well, you can look at it, um, but the gold standard is to do uh, some testing on it. And there's one test known as the fast flush test. And if we remember our anatomy of the arterial line setup, um, it has a pressure transducer and also a flush system, which allows you to kind of purge the system with your pressurized saline bag. And so what you'll do in your fast flush test is you'll activate the flush. And that just means pulling the pigtail and transducer and allowing a burst of pressurized saline to go through the catheter. And so what you'll see is you'll see a square wave appear on the monitor. And then after that, you'll count the oscillations before the waveform returns to baseline. And so if you see more than two uh, oscillations, that includes both up and down oscillations uh, before it returns to baseline, we consider that underdamped. And if you see about one to two oscillations, that's about just right. We like to see that such as in looking at the dichrotic notch. And if you see none or one uh, oscillation before return to baseline, we consider that an overdamped A-line, which has too much energy being absorbed along the way. And so that's what that looks like in practice. We saw these diagrams before. This is your appropriately damped A-line on the A right here. Um, B is that underdamped A-line. And then C right here is this overdamped A-line as we described. So um, how often are our lines appropriately damped? Well, there was an interesting study by, done by Jaffe and colleagues where they looked at 147 arterial lines in their uh, ICU. And they found that about 46% of the time were their A-lines optimally damped. And then about 38% of the time they were overdamped and 17% of the time they were underdamped. And beyond that, the most interesting thing also was that the same damping result was not obtained uh, on necessarily on, on the same arterial catheter on the same day. So only about 64% of the time did they get the same result when they were repeating this fast flush test or this damping evaluation. So that shows that there's some lability in the uh, appropriate damping of these arterial catheters that we use because, you know, they're they're not in a perfect system. They're subject to a lot of fluctuations in uh, intra-arterial conditions, air bubbles, clots, uh, the position of the catheter, et cetera. So um, interestingly, there's a lot of variation in when your catheter is damped or not damped, and that, that can change on an hour to hour basis. So now that we know a little bit about damping, there's another interesting concept I just wanted to cover in this talk, and that's the concept of distal systolic pulse amplification. And so that's an interesting concept that tells us that the arterial waveform will look different depending on which artery it's placed in and how proximal that is to the heart, uh, the origin of the pulse. And so you can see in this uh, diagram here, the uh, arterial pulse waveform looks very different if you place it in the aorta 
uh, versus the dorsalis pedis, kind of that most distal pulse that we evaluate. And so you can see that it starts out rather broad and low amplitude. And as you get um, more distal down the arterial tree, you see that the waveform becomes uh, shorter, yet higher amplitude. And so um, that's because of this phenomenon, as I said, called distal systolic pulse amplification. And so the reason for that is that the systolic amplitude of the pulse is really not just one pressure wave. It's not just that pulse coming out of the heart, but it's actually the sum of a couple of different pressure waves. And so if you look at this diagram, I think this is a nice display of this. It shows us that um, you can have certain a number of waves summing up to cause a different uh, amplitude wave. And so there's, there's two types of waves in this, in this cartoon here. It's showing something called the incident wave, which is actually that pulse wave that comes out of the heart in our example. Uh, and that's the energy and the wave traveling from the contraction of the ventricles ejecting blood into the arterial system. And then on the other hand, you have something called a reflected wave. So when that pulse or when that, um, that wave reaches the end kind of of its travels down at the arteriolar system, some of that energy is reflected back towards um, the heart in a kind of a retrograde fashion. And so if you have one incident wave summing up with a reflected wave as it bounces off the arteriolar system, you get something called a resultant wave. So that resultant wave is actually a different size and a different shape. And that changes depending on how close you are to the reflection point of the arterial pulse. So here's another cartoon I liked that kind of uh, described this phenomenon. You can see on the left bottom of the diagram, you have the aorta, and then it kind of wraps around to the descending aorta, goes down uh, the arterial system, and then reflects off kind of this high resistance point, which is the arterioles. And so the reflected wave um, has a different amplitude depending on how close it is to where it originates. So you might imagine that as uh, as the reflective wave is just born, just kind of produced by bouncing off the end of this arterial system, uh, it's actually higher amplitude. And so it's a bigger wave that reflects and kind of sums up with that, uh, that initial wave, um, that incident wave. And so that's why you see this kind of different waveform and different amplitude of these arterial waveforms. And so if you'll notice this kind of uh, light blue wave in this, in this uh, cartoon or this video, I think this is a really nice demonstration of how this phenomenon works. And so we'll just watch the top here as I click the video and see how that wave bounces off and, and see what it looks like. So this light blue wave bouncing off right there and then coming back on the other side. So let's watch it again. You see that light blue wave bouncing off. Some of the energy is transmitted from there, but you can see that phenomenon where the light blue wave kind of bounces off its reflection point and then comes back. And that's also why you can notice this bottom one, you can see that that wave actually is negative amplitude. So you can see how that wave bounces. And that's why you actually see um, you know, lower diastolic blood pressures in these, in these reflective waves. And so it's not just higher systolic amplitude, it's also lower diastolic pressures because that wave has a, both a positive and a negative deflection. So I think that's a really interesting concept to understand and to appreciate and to know that um, you know, your, your arterial waveform will look different depending on where you place your arterial line. And so this is what this looks like. Again, uh, the, the pulse uh, looks much different in the aortic root versus the dorsalis pedis and all the way along the way. Uh, so finally, you know, if we know that our arterial waveform really has a variable damping uh, properties, it, it changes from hour to hour, and then also, you know, it can change depending on where uh, where he's located in the body, well, really what good is an arterial line? Is it, is it really any better than a cuff blood pressure, which we sometimes use in the, in the pediatric ICU? And the answer is, you know, it still is the gold standard. And this, is, uh, this information comes from that same study by Jaffe et al. Um, and they basically saw that while there was a relatively small median difference in the systolic blood pressure when they were correlating uh, arterial line and non-invasive blood pressures, only about half a point in the systolic blood pressure, they did see uh, a larger difference in both diastolic and mean arterial blood pressures when they were comparing uh, arterial blood pressures and non-invasive cuff blood pressures. And additionally, there was a rather large standard deviation. So even though the mean was initially not that different in systolic, you can see there was a wide variation in the, the median or the kind of standard deviation of uh, the systolic blood pressure and even in the diastolic and maps as well. So again, even though the arterial line has its own foibles and variability, it is still thought to be the, the gold standard as it is kind of a direct transduction of that intra-arterial pressure uh, moving a column of saline. So, um, so now that we know how the arterial catheter works, how we can calibrate it and know that kind of its limitations, 
uh, I think it's just fun to look at a couple case studies and see what disease processes we can diagnose using our A-line alone. I think the key to this is just looking more closely at the amplitude of the waveforms that we see compared to normal, and then also the pattern of waveforms of these arterial waveforms. And that can give you a lot of really good information about certain disease processes you may be seeing in your patient. So first one we're gonna look at, we have a grainy picture, a rather grainy cartoon of this arterial waveform. You can kind of hallucinate the dichrotic notch here and then the diastolic part, or diastolic part here. And you can kind of see that this arterial waveform has a variable amplitude. You can kind of see that it's going from a large amplitude to a relatively smaller amplitude and back and forth every other beat. And so when you look at this, you have to wonder if there's something abnormal going on. This is not normal to see such regular variability in the arterial waveform. So thinking about this, you might be able to guess that with this alternating high and low amplitude waveforms, you may be seeing art that is having alternating ejection from both a filled and an underfilled ventricle. And so a good example of that is this phenomenon called bigemony. And so when you have extra heartbeats outside the normal cardiac cycle because of an, uh, an irritable ectopic focus, you might see something like this on your arterial waveform. You might see every other beat. Um, you might see ejection from an underfilled ventricle because that beat is happening early. And so whether you're having atrial or ventricular bigemony, this is something you can see on your arterial waveform. And that correlates nicely with electrographic act electrographic activity, but you can really see it quite clearly on the arterial waveform as well. All right, next scenario is, uh, again, you can look at the amplitude and the pattern of these arterial waveforms. And you see that as opposed to the last example, you have a small arterial, ampli uh, arterial waveform amplitude, which becomes gradually bigger over a series of beats and then becomes gradually smaller over a series of beats. And so thinking about this, the, the giveaway to this uh, disease process would be if I were to lay the respiratory cycle in parallel with this arterial waveform. And that's because you're seeing the systolic impulse vary with the respiratory cycle in this example. And so that's a concept or a phenomenon known as pulsus paradoxus. And so pulsus paradoxus can be caused by uh, things such as cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericarditis, or obstructive lung disease. And so pulsus paradoxus, just briefly, um, has to do with the respiratory cycle, as I said. And, and we know that during the respiratory cycle, inspiration causes a couple things to happen to the pressures in the chest, including the pressures in the lungs and the heart. So when you have, uh, when you're in the inspiratory part of the respiratory cycle, you see pooling of pulmonary venous blood. And so automatically, you know, you're seeing less LV preload because some of that negative pressure in your chest is causing less filling of the left atrium and subsequently the left ventricle. So you if you temporarily during the inspiratory part of the respiratory cycle have decreased left ventricular preload. And then additionally, uh, you also have some increased venous return to the right side of the heart. So again, uh, you're, you're seeing some blood pooling on the right side of the heart during that inspiratory part of the cycle because you're making a higher negative pressure in your chest and that's kind of uh, encouraging venous filling of the right side of the heart. And so because you have um, some filling of the right side of the heart, you can also have compression upon the LV from the RV. And so this is something uh, where you see the, the intraventricular septum bowing from the RV into the LV and actually causing direct compression. And additionally, um, in addition to the, the lack of preload, you see uh, less space for the LV to fill uh, during this cardiac cycle. So you, you have those things happening in tandem. And then finally, because you have a higher negative pressure in your chest, you have increased left ventricular afterload. So that the left ventricle has a harder time contracting because it's basically pulling against a negative pressure vacuum when you're in the inspiratory part of the, of the respiratory cycle. So these three things working together cause a high variation in um, your cardiac output, depending on where you are in the, in the respiratory cycle. And that's more exaggerated in certain disease processes. Here's just a nice cartoon kind of showing that phenomenon, that pooling of venous blood, pulmonary venous blood, means left, uh, less left atrial uh, filling during the inspiratory part of the respiratory cycle. You have increased venous return to the right heart, as we said. So you see two arrows coming into the right heart here. And then you subsequently have some bowing of this interventricular septum, causing less ability for the left ventricle to fill. And then finally, um, not necessarily well pictured here, but you have increased left ventricular afterload because when you have inspiration and a high negative pressure in your chest, the heart is, the FLV is not as able to eject without uh, using more force. So these, these things happening together cause a um, variation in cardiac output during the respiratory cycle.
And this is kind of what this looks like on our arterial waveform. You have normal respiratory variation, which is less than 10 millimeters of mercury, but in certain disease processes, you kind of have an exaggerated respiratory variation. That's what we call pulsus paradoxus. So anytime that variation is more than 10 millimeters of mercury, we consider that pulsus paradoxus. So just a concept to remember, pressures in the chest, whether they're intracardiac in the pericardium or in the lungs, any of the disease processes as mentioned can affect um, your cardiac output on a second to second basis. And so it's nice to have this arterial line because essentially it's a monitoring device to look at uh, the beat to beat influence of you know, what's going on in the body on the cardiac ejection and cardiac filling and gives you valuable information on your patient. Here's some references for those that are interested on, uh, on these uh, topics and then we'll continue on with more monitoring lectures to come. <laughs>